<laughs> Meredith Martin, Associate Professor of Art History. So Meredith, thank you, first of all, for joining us today. You're co-teaching with Jenny as well at the Institute of Fine Arts. Um, a specialist in early modern French art and empire. She's the author of several important books, including Dairy Queens, The Politics, Pastoral Architecture from Catherine de Medici to Marie Antoinette, and the co-author with Gillian Weiss of The Sun King at Sea, Maritime Art and Gallery Slavery in Louis XIV, France, and Meltdown, Picturing the World's First Bubble Economy which accompanies an exhi exhibition, which is still open to the New York Public Library. Through currently. Sunday. Another week. Through Sunday, another week. Yeah. I show it to the New York Public Library, so you can go to Midtown and see that. Um, Martin has also co-created and produced a previously assumed to be lost 18th century French ballet known as Palais de Porcelain, which was then performed throughout the US and Europe, correct? And has become part of a book also reimagining the Ballet de Porcelain, the story of magic, desire, and exotic entanglement. And you are a founding editor of Journal 18, or is it yes, or right. something? It's a cool yeah, journal online. Yeah. Journal 18, so <laughs> check it out. So Meredith teaches art history, and Jenny teaches history, intellectual history, dance, and um, this conversation, I would love for us to start out for you to have this conversation. What I was really intrigued by is, you have a moment in this book uh, where you say that when the curtain goes up on a Balanchine ballet, <clears throat> all of this meant that when the curtain went up on a Balanchine, Balanchine ballet, audience did not see a ballet. They witnessed a group of dancers making their way through a sh living, shifting labyrinth of split second choices calculations, mistakes, regrets, adjustments, and consequences. It was alive and unpredictable, bound to music, but also free from him. Free, especially from him. The power of their liberation, the dancer's liberation, and of him, Mr. B, watching them free themselves from him with the tools he had given them was part of the drama of his dances. Balanchine's ballets brought them all together in a synchronous musical world, a community governed by the strictures and freedoms of his art. How could real life ever compete? And I would like us to start by saying you wrote a book about the life of a man who's at the center of a world, which stages something that is at once more than life and also so deeply part of life. Maybe you can start out by saying, and then you, know, you can come in and continue this conversation. This is a biography of somebody who's at the center of a community that does not exist for one single person. Everything is done in collaboration and partnership. And what does that world then produce these moments where something on stage seems to, you ask yourself this question in this book, what could compete with this? And then the entire book is the result of this. This man's life is the real life, but what this man did was something that somehow stood in relation to real life in a really amazing way. Yeah, okay, good. Start with a really big question. <laughs> I mean, it's a big book. The, <laughs> it's a wonderful book. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, that quote was to, is to me very much a, a kind of encapsulation of what they did because the, the, the idea of the realer than real world of the stage, which is what George Balanchine's company that he founded with Lindsay Kirsten in the New York City Ballet in 1948. This, is, this was their project together and his project before that was to build a group of dancers around themselves, to build an entire institution because a ballet is a strange thing. It can't be performed without people. So he may have it in his mind, although he didn't usually, he didn't have any particular dance in his mind. When you walk into a studio and say, now do this, now do that, now do this, you go there, you go here. No, it, it would, he had a musical structure. He was a trained musician and he had a very deep understanding of music and he studied scores. And so the, the creation of this, the, of this artificial world on stage with these people, and this is something we could talk about, I'm sure we've been talking about all of these things all evening, was the goal was not to put something perfectly rehearsed and beautiful and set that you would do in a studio and that you would make, and we can talk about how they made it, and then put it on a stage. It was to create basically the circumstances 
of a, of a live encounter. And so that these dancers would be in a structure that was both musical and physical. And then the curtain would go up and he stood always in the first wind so that he could see them and they could see him. And there's a whole almost philosophy around the watcher and being seen and seeing. So there's a, there's a way in which that's an important part of the performance too, even though it's not one that the audience sees directly. So that this, the, the set of circumstances, which are both musical and physical, are not set things. They are, as Suzanne Farrell once put it, you know, she said, I rehearse options, not dances. So that when the dancers get out on stage, what you're seeing is, a, is this live encounter. They, they, may, they play with the music, they play with the whole, the whole structure of the piece in a way that is unpredictable. And because there are often more than one of them on stage, the whole thing becomes unpredictable. And he was very interested in this unpredictability and this sort of, because it created something that was, was live truly live and had an element of improvisation even within a pretty tight structure. So that there's really a sense that, you know, this is, this is why it's realer than real. It's more alive than life. It's more alive than anything we do in our ordinary life. It's something extraordinary. It's something, and it's something that can only happen once. And then it's over. And you might see that ballet again the next night, but you'd be seeing something different, mm -hmm. which is why people care a lot about casting. Because some people, you know, even though people, they, 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 oh, it doesn't matter the casting, the choreography is balancing. No, the casting mattered a lot because some people were really interesting. Um, I think I put in the book, you know, guides through this, this worlds that were being made, and others were less interesting. So you know, the kinds of encounters that would happen on that stage were very much governed by those people, this music here now, as he once put. So maybe that's a beginning. Well, if you go from this, <laughs> this center, then we'll give you the stage. So yeah. the curtain opens up. <laughs> what you're saying is this very complex thing. The music is the guide, but it's not really his strict vision. This is how you have to move. But he's watching the dancers making something happen for that one moment. And then the book unfolds, and there are many, many people who've contributed to this book because right. you've interviewed so many people who then tell you the story of how his life extended in all these different directions. So maybe more than life at that moment, but his life was yes. worthy of we, a book. I didn't get to that. Was so worthy of a book. Yes. There's a whole the, the life. Real life. So yeah. The 20th century right. George Balanchine yeah. Yeah. is is yeah. is a big story, an epic story almost. Mm -hmm. I felt. We've had a request for speaking up louder. So if, right. if you can Do you want us to speak up project yeah. to the to the I'll balcony, try. please. Oh, yeah. Thank yes. you. Yeah. Well, that actually relates to a question I was going to ask you sort of at the end. The ballet master inscription on his gravestone is kind of question to what extent you would consider him, you know. Um, Jennifer and I are teaching a course together this semester, and I was rereading some of Apollo's Angels, and you mentioned, you quote a 16th century French theologian who describes the divine creator God as a kind of ballet master. And, you know, sort of wondering to what extent, um, you know, on the one hand, you have Balanchine as the, as the watcher, and maybe the dancers are kind of internalizing, even though it's different every time, you know, to what extent do you feel like they're bringing their own kind of agency? And is this also a story about their role in creating and generating some of these yeah no very and... much so you know i mean that's something we've talked about some um in, in the context of this course we're teaching but it's it's the dancers it, this is sort of part of the last question right the dancers had a very independent role in this even though they were also um looking to him for instruction and for guidance and for the, the choreography, whatever that is. And, you know, I, one image comes to my mind, the dancer Allegra Kent, I was once told by, um, actually by Robert Wilson, the theater director, he said he was watching Balanchine choreograph one day and he was working with Allegra Kent, who was a great dancer. And Balanchine said to her, 
um, okay, try this. And he did a step of some movement. And she did something completely and utterly different. And he said, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, there was this way in which these dancers knew very well what they were doing and the kinds of freedoms they could take. They knew that if they did something interesting, that's what he was looking for. Mm -hmm. He was looking for, for he something. He was open to it. He was totally, he was not only open to it, that was his that material. Was yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, he came in with a deep knowledge of the musical score. And as I said, he was doing, you know, transcriptions of long of music. So I think what he, and he didn't really share that with them very much. He just would walk into the room with, some idea and work very closely with the pianist and with the, any of the musicians who were, if Stravinsky was in the room, it was the two of them over at the piano, you know, what, hey, is it this, is it that? Um, so the, the music was its kind of own subject. And then there were the dancers and how they responded to him and to the music and to the moment. And so then they would work almost intuitively and I think there were some things that he knew, especially chord of ballet things that would be, you know, patterns or motions that had to be coordinated. Those maybe would be set in his mind, but sometimes on pieces of paper <laughs> that, that would, were diagrams of the way things would go. But, um, but as far as the choreography for solos and principles, no, this is happening in real time. And they would, I mean, even in something like Violin Concerto, which is one of his great dances towards the end of his life, he, um, he made the dance in the beginning on um, Kay Mazo, and then she got sick and she was out for a week. And when they came back, she said, I don't remember a thing. <laughs> and he said, oh, it's okay, we'll start over. <laughs> and so they started over and they did it again. So, you know, he had this facility. It wasn't about the step to this music. It was about this person moving in these ways that became a kind of almost like a, the dancers almost had their own score. I mean, I was interested in the fact that they had always their, not always, but mostly they would describe, the dancers weren't musically trained usually, and they would have, their own counts, different from the musical counts. And at first I thought, you know, why? Why didn't you tell them what the real counts were? <laughs> why not just share that with them? And then I started to think, well, really actually it makes sense because they had their own counts, which was their score, which was related to the musical score, but different. This was their score, which was kind of like interwoven with this musical score. But it wasn't really dancing to music. It was dancing, like he put it, the dancers are in this fish tank of the music and they're swimming in it. And so they're, they're, they have their own mechanism, their own timing, their own ways of making their way through the music that isn't always directly correlated with the music itself. It's coordinated, but not correlated. So, I think the dancers had a big role. And he, you know, in a way, that's why I called the book Mr. B, because it, it was sort of, you don't even see this man without seeing the dancers and without, in my case, talking to the dancers and getting a, a sort of chorus of testimonies about what it was like to be in his presence and to be working with him both, as you know, for good and ill, <laughs> right? Yeah, that actually is, is the volume better? Is there, are we, do we need to go louder or can people hear us? Okay. I, I think we're okay. Just every now and then look at me and I'll just kind of remind okay. you. I'm and trying. Make sure yeah. We'll be good. Yeah, actually, I, I thought I'd ask you, well, first of all, thank you for having me. And it's really an honor to have this conversation with you and to be teaching with you. And, you know, congratulations on all of the many well-deserved oh, accolades and award mutual. nominations and all of the, um, the praise that the book is getting and you know about the title I, I wanted to ask you about that you know the Mr. B and then the subtitle George Balanchine's 20th century you know to my mind it reflects this kind of fascinating push and pull this kind of pas de deux that happens throughout the book where you have on the one hand this sort of close-up very intimate portrayal of the man you know, and, and his dancers but then you also kind of telescope out you know to the larger world historical forces that he's swept up in. And so I wanted to, can you say a bit about, 
you know, why you chose that title and the subtitle and sort of how it reflects the, the scope of the book and also the approach that you took? Yeah, no, the subtitle was to me important because um, it's a gesture to the fact that his life was really a 20th century life on the one hand, and then I'll get to the other hand, but the 20th century life, you know, begins in St. Petersburg in 1904. He lives, he he's, grows up in Imperial Russia. He's a, really still a child when the war starts and then the revolution. And so he lives through the Imperial period, the war, the revolution. He ends up leaving Russia in 1924. Um, he's in Europe in the 20s in Weimar, Germany, in Paris, working with Diaghilev and sort of fully engrossed in surrealism and all kinds of art movements that are going on at the time. And then in 1933, he ends up coming to the United States and he's here for 33 until his death in 83. So it's really a life that kind of travels and experiences both categories world events, I mean, really important world events, and also um, sort of travels the, the, the important cultural spots of the 20th century, if you will. And so that was one thing. And then the other part of the George Balanchine's 20th century was that it's the 20th century that he made up. It's the 20th century that he imagined on the stage, because at each point, he was both part of this history, but also, you know, an artist. So he was absorbing it all and then reimagining it in his own idioms, is maybe the word, um, on the stage. And not that the dances were always political, they weren't, but they certainly carried with them the weight of their time and, and many of the details of their time. So. And then there was also the, the emphasis on the imagination and the 20th century that he made up is not only the dances, but also the, the his almost mystical reaction to the revolution. So that he comes out of the revolution hating, hating the Bolsheviks who destroyed his world, but also deeply immersed in post-revolutionary radical culture and in the art movements of revolutionary Russia. So he's kind of got, got both things. And this is the, the thing that, sort of, it's the founding experience of his life. And one of the things I came to believe about what he did in New York, finally, in the course of his career, it's one of the arguments of the book is that he was part of a group of people who believed that you couldn't have a materialist revolution before you had a spiritual revolution. So it's a kind of counter-revolution that he makes in art, in dance, even though he's part of this modernist movement in Europe and the, and the US, there's something very Russian about it that places it in that context as well as a reaction to the revolution and a kind of almost a secret mysticism mm -hmm. in the middle of American modernism. So that's that's the see the title had carried a lot of weight. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to ask you a little bit about his relationship also with the visual arts. And obviously yeah. it's a question that yeah. I'm interested in and that we're talking about in our in our class. And I think you know his the foundational role in the question of music, his collaboration with Stravinsky, I mean, that, that's really well known, but you also describe so many different artists that he was either influenced by or that he collaborated with. You know, you have Malevich, you have the most realists. Um, also his interest in things like icons, and he's constantly thinking about Russian icons, and maybe that's connected a little bit to the kind of mystical spiritualism, but I think there's other ways in which that um, the icon has been mobilized in his work. So. Could you talk a little bit about that? Kind of yeah, I mean, I really, choice. I came to, you know, the music, as you say, is, is as you put it, the floor. That's the, the sort of foundation. But but he also had said at various points, you know, dance is visual art. And he was very interested in how the 
and very analytic about how the eye meets the stage and how it travels and where attention is, how, how you guide attention. And, and he, he learned a lot about that from, I think from painting in the beginning, especially. And he was, you know, involved in, in with painters in many of the movements in, in early revolutionary Russia, but also Diagolab. especially with Diaghilev and with, you know, when he got to Paris and, and uh, met Picasso, Matisse and Deran, and, and these became the people in Pavia, and these were the people that he was working with, the Kiriko, they, they were all there. And they were just his friends and his people he was with. And he, you know, he owned uh, Magritte, he owned Beckman, he, he wanted to work with, with George Grosch. He, he, he had, he, he did the first Seven Deadly Sins with, with Brecht and Weil and with, with a whole elaborate visual apparatus. Um, so he, he was very interested in, in the visual. And he learned from this about this from film as well. Um, he worked at Hollywood. He did uh, quite a lot of film. He worked with some great um, cameramen, including Greg Toland, who um, some of you may know. And he so and he he talked about this, you know, about how do you uh, he learned how do you position where do you where are you going to position the eye? You have a quote in Apollo of Angel, probably also in the record. Yeah. You say people come to the ballet. But they don't really see. You have to show them. Yeah, that's right. I and then, some ways, what you're saying. That. Yeah. Can you say a little bit about the go back to the icons also and kind of what dimensionality there's? You you open the book. It's very moving and kind of they're very moving, spiritual, but they're kind of devoid of emotionality. But you, and you go to the ballet and you, he says he says about the audience. They don't see anything. You got to show them. Mm -hmm. I like this attitude. It's a little bit, it's a kind of whiff of condescension, but also, <laughs> sure. but I'll, I'll help you along, you know, we'll, 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 yeah, make, yeah, we'll, I mean, we'll make you see actually, you know, we're like sort of what, what artists do in a way, we make you see. They, they don't know what they're looking for. Yeah, I mean, don't you think that's sort of a, a role of art as well to make people see? Even when we work, Meredith and I were standing in front of a Poussin at the, the Met last week. <laughs> Unvarnished, unframed, the natural, light. yeah, I mean, oh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I think. Um, I mean, also, the icons, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's also something about the icon, the sort of iconic. I mean, in a way, it seems somewhat paradoxical because you think about this constantly thinking of the body in motion. But, but the role of the icon also has to do, I think, in some ways with the way that it, it kind of pushes outward. To... Yeah, yeah. This is really striking to me. I mean, the idea of the icon as a as as a flat surface. And one that that has a, a kind of reverse perspective, um, which which means that you're not seeing into the painting, but the painting is designed to actually reach out to you as a spiritual, spiritually so engaged so person. Kind of immersing. It's not just visual. It's sort of functioning on another. It's functioning level. on another it's against level. Against that kind of illusionism of the kind of classical. Yeah. Exactly. You know, it's not, not in a way, because the, I mean, I think the, the illusionism, movie, it's not illusionistic in that sense. No, it's something that you can actually use to transverse, is that the word, um, into another universe, really, into the world of the dead. You can, you can enter this and be in, have access to an otherworldly space, which is the part of him that was I mean, he was raised in the Russian Orthodox Church, so he had that as a as a base. But he was also, uh, I I came to see by following his reading patterns and and so and Lincoln Kirstein, who called him an amateur theologian. And he he really read very very widely in religious literature. He was quite interested um, in uh, Sufism. And in um, science fiction, mm -hmm. in uh, you know, one of the great moments in the research was when he, one of the dancers, had told me that she had asked him, um, "How do you do this?" And he said, "Oh, Donovan's brain, Donovan's brain." 
And I don't know if that rings a bell to anybody here, but I was running to Donovan's grave, <laughs> which is a science fiction film from, I think, the 50s, um, about a, a guy who dies and his brain is then hooked up to some, you know, it's a whole uh, sort of mystical fairy tale in a science fiction mode. And he read a lot of science fiction. So he was interested in all kinds of, of, of ideas of what is otherworldly? How do you get to a metaphysical plane in a, a normal human world? Right, the cloud and the and cloud, cloud and the trousers. trousers. Exactly. Mind of Mayakovsky. Maya, a poem by Mayakovsky. He called himself the cloud and trousers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. <laughs> it's a good name. Could be known as that. I think there could be worse things. <laughs> so well, he called himself. I know. That. But you explain how that poem is a bit darker than that one would think. It's not a Margarita. Yeah, it's, it's a very harsh poem. It's a harsh, harsh <laughs> poem about the revolution and about, you know, it's. Kind of devastating. So it was both, and it was written during the revolution. So it was both a gesture to something that he came from that mm -hmm. was very, very disturbing, mm -hmm. and also to a kind of separation in his own being that I think he felt acutely, which was that there was some spirit, cloud, mm -hmm. creative, otherworldly aspect to him. And he would say things like, um, I'm not a man, I'm water, I'm air, I'm a cloud. And I think he genuinely felt that way, but then of course he was also a man who had all of his own physical desires and uh, you know, loved food and a very sensual person who cared a lot about smell and perfume and the feel of fabric and um, sex and women and <laughs> you know you capture it really well in the book you have um you know this figure with these kind of like obsessive you know these physical urges and also someone who lives through a huge darkly you know violent traumatic over and over and over totally again and who life. is on the one hand sort of deeply attached but is also a bit able to distance himself you know whether it's kind of living through these traumatic regimes periods soaking up these deep cultural influences and then kind of Moving on, and one of my favorite phrases in the book, at some point you said he has the detachment of a survivor. Yeah. And, you know, I, I just, I wanted to ask you about sort of, just generally that sense of detachment or that kind of, again, a sort of um, push and pull between you know, this intimate, this obsess obsessiveness and this kind of physical desires and then this ability just really to rise above, to be the cloud, to be distance, but also how that kind of, the detachment of a survivor feeds into the work. Where yeah, you sort of no, see the that. detachment of the survivor, you're so right. I mean, because it's very much an exile life. And so it's, a, it's in fact, a lonely life. I mean, he was a deeply lonely man, even though he surrounded himself with people and dancers and built a whole company around himself so that there would be a world around him. Um, but he had, as you say, he almost died several times. He had the revolution, he had TV, he was in a magic mountain satisfying. Um, he had these kind of unexplained wild physical collapses at various moments in his life, even though he was also very strong because he lived in a deeply physical existence, you know, working with dancers and performing and traveling and all of these things. So he he was he was both um, had both great endurance, but also this mechanism that Meredith, you're pointing to, I think, which is that he, he could go through a really difficult experience and loss, and he could feel it intensely, intense love affairs that were devastating, and just put him on his knees at the end of them. Zorina, who didn't love him the way he loved her. His fifth life wife, Tanika Leclerc, who got polio at the peak of her career and was crippled. And she was not, she was both his, his greatest muse in those years and also his wife. And so there was a way, you know, this was a tragedy for him. And he took care of her, but then he also, you know, he could pull back. He could art, 
heart was the thing. Uh, he was going to make, he was driven to make dances. And I think he felt that his main purpose on earth was to make dances. And that's what he knew how to do. And that's what he was going to do. And anything that got in his way. And he could be cruel in that, in the interest of that. Because that there's in that pulling back, there's a calmness too. And there, and he did have that calmness. So that he could, I don't think he was a cold person, but he he lived for the dance. And he didn't have a life outside of the dance that we would have considered normal in some way, right? He didn't end up getting married and he married his dancer. Five times he did. <laughs> Five times he got divorced. That's, <laughs> That's part of it. <laughs> I mean. Okay. But I mean, he couldn't make a, a, a marriage in the world. He, he made marriages that were about yeah. the life of the state. Mm-hmm. Back to your first question. I mean, it, or the first thing we were talking about. Well, let's shift a little, maybe hone in on one of the dances. Okay. Um, can you say a little bit about the Agon, the origins of? Agon, I mean, maybe most of you in the audience have, have read the book, but for those who haven't, I think that's just a really compelling story. And I think it really speaks, in some ways, it kind of exemplifies this profound, you know, entwinement of life and art for him. So, yeah, you know, just talk a bit about that one. I mean, Agon is, is, the, is the dance that sits kind of in the center of his life and, and career. It's the, basically the center point of the book as well that reason. And it's uh, in 1957, and it's music by Stravinsky. It was a commission score. They had been working on it for years before that. Um, you know, Lincoln Kirstein, correspondence with, with Stravinsky. What's it going to be? How are we going to imagine it? And finally, you know, after going through many possible scenarios and narrative that this dance might be, Stravinsky just says, I'll write music and you will do the dance. So that's the, the sort of starting point, but it, it keeps getting delayed. Stravinsky has a has a um, heart attack. Okay, now what? And then Tammy gets sick. Tanko gets polio, and her his life stops for a moment. They're in Copenhagen when it happens, and um, she's at death's door. They don't know if she's going to survive. And he li- moves into the hotel and stays in Copenhagen for nearly a year, taking care of her and trying to help her. He's determined that he's going to make her well again. By which, of course, he means that he will make her move her limbs, at least as a human being, if not as a dancer. And they work and try, and of course, she's crippled. That's it. And it's not going to happen. And um, finally, they end up going back to New York once she's well enough to leave. And they settle into New York and goes off to California to see Stravinsky and to get this belt. And out of this intense crisis in which the company is kind of floundering back in New York, they're trying to do it on their own. They've lost him. They don't know what's going to happen. Is the whole thing going to fold? What's going to... And then all of a sudden, he's back in the theater and he's 400%. And they are absolutely galvanized with him every day in the studio. He's got, you know, Diana Adams and Arthur Mitchell, these two great dancers, and he's putting together this dance. And they kind of know that this is really important. And it turns out it's not the first, but it's it's probably the most important of his so-called abstract ballets in the sense that it strips the stage of scenery, there's the costumes are leotards and tights, so they're practiced clothes, with, which are, as Anne Hollander always would say to me, yeah. those <laughs> are costumes. <laughs> all, all dresses, costumes. All dresses, everything. Costumes <laughs> and she's right. So, you know, there's that, then there, there's just light mm-hmm. and a blue cyclone backdrop. And dances that with Stravinsky's music, and they have worked together closely. Stravinsky's been in the studio with him on these dances. And the, the dances that come out are, I mean, it's, it's, it's 26 minutes, 28 minutes, I think, I can't remember. And it's, it's just, I mean, it was an immediate masterpiece, kind of, you know, it's not a word you want to use very, very much, but 
this is what it was. And it, it, the audiences were absolutely floored. And in this dance, there's this palada. I mean, this is currently what you, you know, you can see the, without, this was one of the challenges of the book, is not to reduce the art to the life, but to also find the connections to the life, because after all, it is happening in the life. And here was one moment where, and I got this from the dancers, they could see that there were movements in this potager that came out of the ways in which they thought he had worked with his wife, helping her limbs lift. And there are moments when the man lifts the woman's legs and actually manipulates them and moves her around so that she's not, and he would say, don't do anything. Let him do it. So, you know, she is a kind of almost like a yeah. mannequin. Yeah. It's an amazing dress to come out of her weakness or something, but it is actually even there empowering her to something just beyond her. Exactly. It's not just be a, a doll. No. Actually be totally present so you can achieve this. Exactly. And in fact, you know, you've seen a lot of them. You said you've seen a lot of them. They are also available, right? There's like old, the, the I've original I've seen a lot version. of them and I spent the whole weekend yes. sort of, you know, rereading the book and you got to go see, you know, perform I went on to, stage. I, went to I was the watching to see a YouTube clips with my daughters who were trying to kind of do the performances. And, you know, I think it's, this idea of the Balanchine body, yeah. you know, that you keep referring to throughout the book and, and you know, and, and the way he really revolutionized the art form, you know, I think there's there's a passage in which you you describe this, like what it actually <laughs> kind of consists of, and it's it's after the Agon chapter, but I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah, but I think no, it very much please. pertains to what's yeah. happening in, in Agon, and it, it made me understand, and I have seen a lot of Balanchine on stage, and it just made me understand what, what he really, how he just really utterly and kind of forever changed the art form and, and what you describe. And you, know, you say that before, you know, that the ballet body was kind of parceled out, you know, symmetrical, kind of considered to be divided along a sort of north-south axis and an east-west axis. I mean, think of the Vitruvian man, you know, exactly. and he, he broke that all down, you know, and partly, as you say, it's because he had experienced, he'd lived through the idea of a body broken down, broken in pieces as a result of war, as a result of disease, his own personal biography, but also these larger events that he was a part of. And then and he had to kind of build it, build it back up. And I hope I'm just going to quote a couple of sentences just to Please. what you say. And so the balancing body, and this is me quoting Jenny, is it could be grotesque and tangled or out of joint, or it could be beautifully patterned and harmonized across multiple bodily and spatial planes. But whatever the style of musical form, and here was the catch, this whole body had no clear axis, no tonal center. Its foundation stone, worse, its default was chaos. Stability and perfection were death and had to be fought with sheer energy and the will to life, sent coursing through the body in dynamic opposites that might just might hold, thanks in large measure to music and immense physical energy. His dancers didn't stop, they didn't pose, they just kept moving. To dance in that body was to know that you were on the edge and it might all give way. Holding it together was a complicated physics of energy and time, but also of anxiety. No dancer was alike, just as no human was alike, and he changed his dances all the time, as he said, tailored them to each individual. I just think oh. that that completely, it's a beautiful piece of writing, it's but, great. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> but it also just kind of really made me understand something about, about Balanchine's contribution. Can you say a little bit more what you think the difference is from previous, like, well, I mean, just, we have just, the expert here, but it's good to see how we no, understand yeah. our work. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm interested in this, you know, there's a lot of talk about how Balanchine kind of looked back to like court ballet, like the era of Louis XIV, and looked at Beauchamp Foyer notation and, and sort of reinvented that art form. And I think in some sense, you, you can see that in Adon, right? I mean, he's looking at the choreography, the patterning on the floor, and, but there's also really a fundamental break that you articulate, articulate and it's not about the kind of ultimate sense of symmetry and harmony. He may have been about a kind of neoplatonic plane, a sort of transcendence, but it's not the transcendence that's sought by classical ballet of the 17th century or any other period. It's a kind of acknowledgement of, in a way, the sort of the futility, I don't know, of the transcendence or, or that, you know, you kind of never quite get there and that you're, hold, you're held in this impossible suspension. And that's part of the power of the work, but also, you know. Yeah, no, I agree. There is something, um, dark as well. And as you say, it comes from it comes from the, the broken body and the chaos of the broken body and the fact that you can't 
can't really return to that past body, that imperial body. You can't because it's it's too it's too balanced. It's too organized. It takes an army to keep that body organized, right? A really big imperial army that's doing parades. All you know, you can see the iterations of this throughout imperial culture. And and the the body he comes up with is one that's just um, yeah, almost impossible to live in. And so that's why you have to have this live performance because you've got a body that is, I mean, it's hard to explain, but I mean, I'm gonna just, because there's like, a, the, it, what I learned when I was a dancer and trained in his system was that you can't just like put all the pieces together and balance. Oh God, got it. <laughs> you know, you can't, you have to be, reaching this way and that way and that way and that way and that way and this way and, and you've got to have all of the dynamics in a moment, in a moment, a second of stability that you pass through because if you try to hold it, you're going to go, you're going to mm -hmm. fall. So it's, it, and he was all about falling, you know, don't, don't bore me, don't just stand there, do something, play film. He was beautiful. Because they were pushing past, and there was a way in which it was also a body that, I mean, the grotesque part was that it could be extreme and almost violent. And I try to bring this out in the in the aspects of the training because the extremity of the turnout, the extremity of the, of the you know, the legs up to here, extending up to here, and the the the, the hip joints, the knee joints, the the back, the, the flexibility, the, the, the tremendous um, labor that went into all of this. And also the, the, I mean, there is something violent about it. You are actually, I mean, this is, this is metamorphosis. This is like the body being changed into something else. And so they were, they were all involved in making that change because he could suggest it but they had to do it. So, and often they did more than he suggested. Mm -hmm. So that there was a way in which, um, you know, the extremes were created again in this collaboration between them. Steve. And it's also about speed and, you know, the 20th century, right? Yeah, it's about right. speed it's modern, and- It seems like a, if chaos is at the, there's no more center, there's chaos. Yeah, there's, there's That's no the 20th century body. Exactly. And you say it's an impossibility, but the quote you read, which is really gorgeous. And a lot of the book is actually also really entertaining to read because Jenny changes her style every once in a while. So yeah. she explains something and then she says, in the company, not so. And I was right. Of course, like this would have it happened. Did. It didn't. Yeah. And then she gives a recipe or something. It's really, it's, it's really, it's actually, it changes direction, yeah. which in a productive way, it actually yeah. keeps you on your toes. And then the readers are looking, oh, so this is happening now. I didn't expect that direction. Yeah. But the quote you read there is a kind of is a kind of defiance of mortality when it comes exactly. out of this. And it's not about just survival. He's an he's a, an immigrant, doesn't know his own secrets at some point. He comes, but it seems to me that beauty is also resisted in a way. And I, I brought this to the lighthouse. I was just reading Wishing Your Wolf a couple of weeks ago. She has a moment in which in, into the lighthouse, this is 1927. She says, Beauty. This is it, Mrs. Ramsey's stilled life. She had it there. And two pages later, beauty arrests life. And stillness is not life. It kills it. So Virginia Woolf undoes her own insight and says, beauty is that. She said, no, beauty is not life. Actually, beauty is a frozen image. It needs to be. So can you say a little bit from this quote? These are bodies moving through time. They'll never again be in this position. Never again. And I think this kind of defiance or this kind of resistance to mortality and to time, which in some ways in the, in the book you say, by cutting time into shorter pieces, he gave us more time. He, he actually lets you see, this is when they have that, they're holding this for a moment, very precious, very precarious. There's more time suddenly, because we have no time. So then he comes up with the experience of 10. So this kind of defiance or this kind of, um, dancing in a way without an assurance that this will work. Um, but this means being alive. And in some ways connected to what the dancers experienced. Because they all seemed so, I mean, you said this over and over, they all seemed so alive. And they look back at this and say, this was, this was 
the greatest thing in my life. Yeah, because they were more alive than they ever were in other parts of their life. I mean, that, and, and these dances, because of the relationship to the music, which is, after all, a relationship with time, is a part of music, but a way of organizing time. So that's what dance was, too. He, he even, I mean, this was one of the thrilling moments for me in, in the research is when I found these choreographic notes that he had scrawled on bits of paper, and they were in his hand. And he talks about um, time and breaking it down. And he talks about Spinoza and duration and time and what's the difference. And, and you know, I think he really saw that's what he was doing. That's what dance was, as you said. It was a way of ordering time, which is a way of ordering the universe. So back to the Neoplatonic thing, but differently. But like differently, possible. exactly. Yeah. And it can't be ordered that old way. That That is what he called ballet ballet. That's the old ballet. He was really committed to being, and it was what he called it, progressive. And we can't slow down. We can't do that old stuff anymore. He didn't want to do Diablo again. He didn't want to do sleeping. But he did Swan Lake a little bit because, well, we didn't sell the tickets. And, you know, he was also very practical about those kinds of things. And I think he liked Tchaikovsky. The music comes along there. So he, he did it, um, or at least a condensed version. But, um, but yeah, time was, was absolutely the, the, the core of the whole, the whole project. And it, was, it had to do with his relationship to music. It's amazing. <laughs> beauty, though, beauty, I think, you know, beauty in a, in a fixed form he would have had the same reaction, but because dance had a, was always breaking its own promise to beauty, mm -hmm. right? And he was very interested in glamour and beautiful women. You know, he self-consciously, very self, I mean, everybody knew it. He, cho he chose what he considered to be beautiful women. And that wasn't a set body type. It had to do with maybe how, how certainly how you looked. A beautiful face, but it was also about how you move, and above all, and the dancers who really got to dance a lot were the ones who knew how to move. And even if you know, I even remember there was one dancer. I remember her. She was like, like a Botticelli painting or something. She was sort of classic, beautiful, but she was very weak and she couldn't really move. And he would say, like a noodle. <laughs> you know, she can't really dance. And so, you know, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. You know, she couldn't. Really, so it wasn't. Oh, we need a perfect body. That and, kind of and say something about the role of women, because yeah, okay, they are so present in the book, and you give them so much space. Well, what did you think about the women? <laughs> well, I actually thought a lot about it, like everybody who reads the book, and I thought, what is this relationship, which is such a supercharged relationship of someone who enables very, very young people who are entering life and have a bit of a gift, but also have somehow the discipline to go through this incredibly difficult training and turn to him to become themselves in a way maybe that we wouldn't quite understand what this means, but for them, they seem to have they found themselves on stage for moments, and that translated into their lives in a way. But I would be curious. I thought it was um, a very exceptional kind of dissection of what is a relationship to a mentor who is at the center of an institution that was constantly about the collapse and fragile and politics and all this, but somehow created a an artistic home for people. And that is a very rare thing. They shared a mission. They couldn't have done it without the other. So Mr. B couldn't have done it without any of the dancers. I think that seems to that comes through in the book. That there wasn't one day where he thought, well, I could be, I could do this without them. In some ways, he wouldn't be who he was without the dancers. So this kind of codependency, yes. but it opens up this space of power and all this kind of. But I I read it as a kind of they're pursuing something they neither would quite know what to call it art beauty, being moved, being transported, all wrapped in love and desire and 
the erotics of this relationship. But I just couldn't, I didn't really think you took a position. You just said, this is what happened here. It's a rare thing. It may never happen again. Yeah, no, that is how it felt for me. And I don't know how you felt. Yeah, how did you feel about it? I'm curious. <laughs> I mean, I think it's, um, I think you write very frankly mm -hmm. about the, the relationships and, and very bravely, you know, and I wonder if there was the kind of pushback, you know, because I think, you know, it would be all too easy now to, I mean, would Bounty have gotten me too canceled? Probably somehow yeah. along the way, multiple times, I don't know, you know, but I think the relationship is more complicated. Was it exploitative? Yes, sometimes it was. Was it also, you know, I, I was wondering, I don't know the sort of scope of, you know, the kind of critical reception of, of Balanchine and, and how you sort of, how your you know, very frank, very sensitive, very nuanced discussion of his relationship with his dancers and the kind of primary role that they take in kind of co-creating some of this work. Is this a kind of revisionist approach? Does this sort of reclaim a bit of a sense of the power dynamics to give the women a voice, just calling it Mr. B, you know, I, I don't know, I had a lot of more questions than answers, but I actually appreciated that you took it on, you know? And did and, you feel, I felt I kept seeing them on stage. Well, I and, kept right? you know, going to look like at them. Like, who is, with this yes. one, what does this yeah. one look like? So it's very present, and I didn't think, oh, I want to see when Mr. B is standing in the wing. I was like, wow, yeah. she's giving life to this moment. Yes. Like that came across, but I, I think you're right. It's like, and I don't know this the question you just asked about the, is this a bit of a revision or correction? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it's a revision or correction. I mean, I, I think it's certainly a, um, I mean, what you both said was the decision I made. I obviously thought about this a lot too. And I just um, I decided that the only way to approach it, because I talked to a lot of dancers, I mean, I really interviewed over 100 dancers, and I, I, so I came to see what they were telling me as a kind of testimony. This was their testimony of what happened to them and how it was to be in George Balanchine's New York City Valley. And so what I decided to do was to lay it all out without bringing the moral judgments of our time to his time or even of his time to his time, but just to say, this is what it was. And then that that's enough, that's the, that's the story. And so if people wanna say more, that's, that's fine. But I mean, I felt I was true to the material. I tried to be very clear about, the, about his sexuality, about their, involvement in his sexuality, all of these things, and about the power dynamics mm -hmm. and the complex relationship, as you said, that that went into making this art in which he loved some of them, they loved him. Yes, he was in power over them. They were also in power over him because he was vulnerable to them and didn't exist without them. And they couldn't dance without him. So it's a very complicated thing. And then the erotics of, of the erotics of art, it's not a new subject, right? And it, it was definitely present here, both in the dances themselves, which were very erotic. I mean, that dance of, of Agon that we were talking about, Diana Adams, who was the lead woman, and again, there was the same remove that you were talking about earlier. She was almost cold in this dance. It's not like she went out there and, and, and was very sexy or something, not at all. She, she just did the movements. And even um, at one point, finally they switched cast and she watched it or she saw it from the front. And she said, oh my God. God, <laughs> I was doing that, <laughs> you know, because the legs are split wide, you know, he's leaning over, there's a whole, there's a, there's a lot of, um, there's a, and, and he's a black man, and she's a white woman, this is 1957, soon after Little Rock, or before, I can't remember, and it, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's a, it, 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 yeah, the whole thing is, I, it's very complicated and extremely powerful. 
powerful. And they, they, for them, it was powerful. I wonder whether the ones he got married to. Yeah. And then there's a whole bunch of other people, and then there's a whole bunch of male dancers, and there's colleagues and all this. And I wonder whether this word love we apply in one category. Okay, so you fell in love with this one, and you stuck with that one. And, but there is something which is really hard to describe, and the word love is not used for this. But what is this relationship of all these people with this man who people like to call a genius? Because he does something with them. He co-creates an experience. And people love their teachers in a, in a totally non-sexual thematic way, like in a complicated way. People yeah. love people who run institutions. Like there's lots of love that we don't define as Valentine's Day today. So we, we code it right <laughs> and we got it or we don't, you know, it's like that kind of, but what is this other, what are these other dimensions he had? And maybe the spiritual is one part that he was creating a bit. You said at one point, was this a cult? They all believed in it. Yeah, a moment ago. Oh my God, I was part of it. Yeah. Well, we're glad to have you here. <laughs> I don't think so. And here's why. I think the answer to your question is that it was service. Okay. He he created a sense of they were not serving him, although of course that too is complicated because they all sought his approval intensely. And they cared intensely about every move he made. They were watching to read the tea leaves of what he thought. But what he managed to create in this institution was a feeling of service to art. And it's it's hard for in some ways for us to see that today because we live in such an ironic time. And so that sounds a little naive. But it wasn't, and it, I think it's truly what made people loyalty. So many of them stayed for so long. I mean, especially the people in the institution. Because the dancers, of course, it's hard to dance a long, long time. So they would move along in generations. But although some of them, you know, Jacques D'Amboise was there from forty-nine to finish. So. Um, many of them did stay, but the, this this sense, and I got it from you know the stage hands and the orchestra people and the lighting people and the everybody who was making some part of this world happen. You know, turning on the lights making sure every, that people had the right shoes, making sure that the costumes were right. There, was, there were literally hundreds of people involved in this enterprise and they were devoted to him because he wasn't, he was devoted to them and the art that they were all putting on stage. And you know, whatever the other problems and there were definitely cruelties and, and things that happened that were difficult for People, and some people left. But I think almost that's the chorus I heard. And that I saw when I was there myself, that there was something selfless about the whole enterprise. And really, if, even for the dancers, it wasn't about them going on stage and being stars. The whole point was that they were supposed, that the idea was. find your way through the work that we do and through the intensity of the technical requirements and the musical requirements where your own ego and self disappears and you are just present. So there really was an, a, a, a kind of an almost a T.S. Eliot kind of philosophy to this performative of life and also um, aesthetic. So the, the distancing and the, the flatness of the, of the performance and the bodies, but it was also the face. It wasn't smiling. It wasn't, you know, sure sometimes, of course. But the idea was, it's not about you acting out there. You would say things like, don't sing, just dance. And people would take that and say, oh, you're trying to dumb down the dancers. But I don't think that's what it was. 
I think what he meant was, your words are in your way. Be present in the body, in the moment, in the music. Get rid of yourself. Just get rid of yourself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not, okay, it's, it's, it's not representation. Yeah, exactly. It's not presentational. It's not representation. Even though it is presentational. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, <laughs> I know it's, it's one of the many paradoxes. So how would, um, what, would, I, what would you call it? Not representation. Yeah. It's dancing. It's dancing. And, and they, of course, they were presenting themselves and they were on stage. But there was, a, when, you, when you do that thing where you lose the ego, if you want to put it that way, you sort of, that's where the, the intimacy of the performance comes from. It's paradoxically, kind of maybe it is kind of related. You know, I was always thinking about this paradox of abstraction. Right? How do you have abstraction with the body? Because it's constantly returning to the get to a kind of zero sum game where you can yeah, you exactly. Know, it achieves that. It's really. Um, I want to follow up on something that Billy said about about writing, and then maybe we should open it up to questions yeah. from the audience or Zoom questions. Um, but which is just about you know this. On the one hand, you kind of. Um, you have a personal relationship to you know this this story, right? You know, as a trained a dancer who danced in many of Balanchine's performances, and and you only sort of mention that briefly at the end, you know, in the author's note. But I feel like in a way, you're kind of present throughout, mm -hmm. sort of in the shifts in in style, the kind of tone. I mean, and maybe it's because I, I know you a little bit, but there's a kind of intimacy that when you approach the the subject, and it's different from Apollo's Angels, you know, which I also love for different reasons. But I feel like there's a deliberate and there is this kind of play with, with style and it changes and it does kind of you know surprise you and kind of take you out of the moment. And that's, that's this. but I, I just wonder for you, your kind of experience of researching for, you know, and talking to all of these people, this experience of writing the book and and also the kind of way in which you wrote it. You know, did, did you sort of think about that? Did you want to kind of be an yeah. absent presence? You know? Well, Mary, thank you for um, noticing that because I I I actually saw the book as very different from Apollo's Angels, and, the, and I saw the, the whole challenge of the book as quite different. I mean, and that's in a way why I was interested in trying to do it, and it's one of the things that engrossed me the most was the writing and how to, um, you know, it's, it's such a bizarre thing to write about somebody who's dead and to try even the idea of, that you could get inside someone's mind. Even a living person is <laughs> crazy, right? But a dead person, <laughs> that's even crazier, especially one where there's very few sources. It's not like there's diaries and letters and there's just a smattering of things and then there's the dances. So my challenge was really, how can I write about this in a, in a way that takes a reader in inside balancing, but still, you know, I have a footnote at the end, right? Still be as true to the, the facts as it were, as I can be. So I was, I, the way I approached it finally was to carry the book from a world of history and ideas and the facts of his life and the events of his life deeper and deeper into his imagination and the ways in which I could understand that through the work that I had seen and done and through a variety of sources, interviews, archival documents, reviews, any, anything that I could find to get my hands on. So that the book, the arc of the book is really from the real to the real end then we, and it ends inside of a dance which was to me important because it, it's a way of recognizing that that was the real world for him, that that's really where he died, was inside the dance, that's where he lived, that's where he died. And then also just like, I mean, the writing of the book was, was I, I hardly know how to describe it. It was kind of lonely, but also as writing can be, right? But, but I was really focused on 
him as a person and as trying to understand who he was without being too psychological about it and to evoke that through the dances, through the various episodes in his life and through the writing. I think there's a quality. I read it as a, in, in, with all due respect to all the historians in the room, it, it read as a great novel in the way you put some small breadcrumbs in the beginning and some hints and the icons become the Russian icons of his childhood. And you kind of think, oh, interesting. But you kind of know they're going to become more interesting and they become more interesting and get again more depth. And there's another insight about them. And there's occasional moments when he wherever he arrives in Berlin or in Paris, and you, you see, have a scene and you're not quite sure, you think, no. But then it comes back and you say, and if you're not saying, oh, now it's on stage. You're saying something here has been, you read this thing and you gave it a, a bit of an interpretation of what could this be a bit larger context. And then you give the scene later on. And then as a, as a reader, you're making these connections. And they're almost like a light motif or a metaphor that goes through a little bit. And then it's mm -hmm. really, because it doesn't say this is here and now there's a causal connection or there's correlation or there's analogy. It's just, we don't quite know what the connection is because it is in his mind, which is also not a very strictly analytic, rational mind. It's a mind filled with a spiritual, stuff. with stuff and <laughs> it's a spiritual mind. He's a spiritual, a spiritual person, mind. which is an amazing thing. He's a spiritual person working with bodies and he's interested in abstraction, working with bodies. Yeah. And he's interested with a two dimensional scene, which was, and loving these people. He loves these women on stage and lets the world see them being themselves. It's actually an amazing moment when someone what would love be, but to let the other person be seen for themselves. That's a great moment in love. It doesn't last, but, <laughs> <laughs> but in some ways what you said, abstraction is there, spiritual, but the human body is at the center. And I think it, it kind of pulls him back. But the writing is also, um, I kind of know a little bit of your routine. I felt like you're going to the studio every morning, 6 a.m. writing, and it, and it kind of, it doesn't show. No. It's like per amazing performance. And you think, oh, Jenny just sat down and wrote this book. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I took you a bit longer, I think. Yeah. But the training, you don't see that training that gets people onto the stage at Lincoln Center. You don't really see that. You know, it's just, it's, No, thank you. Yeah, I'm glad if it works. Oh yeah, it totally works. It totally works, right? Totally right. right? It's a transporting read. Kind yeah. of in a way you're kind of in this and you feel you're that's what I my original question is you inhabit this world but it's not our world yeah it's nobody's world yeah. and they're in it for a moment and he actually to me is like he becomes he lives the 20th century and then disappears and you're not answering that question what happens to the Valentine ballets and what have they this this is this this happened that's an amazing thing what happens next will, will be next. There will be something else, but it will not be, this is not a book to say, oh, here's the blueprint, start your theater like that. No, there's no model in here, I think there's no. No, he was a, he, he was a genius and he was also a deeply humble person and, and he just lived his life and made his dances. And then, as he said, it was my time to go. And so I, you know, when it's my time, I will go. Yeah. Like a cloud of trust. Like a cloud of trust. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder if someone from the audience would like to join, and if we do, we will amplify your voice somehow. Uh, yes. I'd love to. Uh, I mean, it's a wonderful book, and congratulations. And and by the way, I, like probably many other people here, I went to City Ballet a few weeks ago, and went to the Euro Balancing program, and I had different feelings about everything having just read your book. So mm -hmm. your book has a real, a real role to play, a real impact. Clearly, things will be different whenever we think about your challenging that. But I'll, I'll change the subject completely. Aside from speed was interesting to me, what did America do with this quickness of America? And it also feels very urban. I'm very aware because I've been working on a Connecticut project that they go to Hartford and he goes, oh my God, I can't live here. <laughs> and, you know, I want to get me to New York. And I mean, it lasts three days. We took Austin on three days and he's back in New York. So he needs the city, he needs the urban. I mean, Completely different. Anyway, I loved it. Uh, Jerome Robbins. So then we've got, and we've been talking about the women, no question, this city ballet is about the glory of women. I mean, put it simply and whatever. Uh, and, and then there's Robbins, who on, by all accounts, I did, I never met him personally, I don't know this, but <clears throat> you probably did meet him, apparently was an impossible he made dancers crazy and he made his friends crazy, he made everybody crazy. 
but he was completely obsessed, but, but he absolutely bowed to George Ballinger. And, and even reading your book, I kept thinking, how did this happen? How did this man who always ran the show everywhere and made people crazy with his dictatorial qualities, how is it that, how do you understand? I just want you to elaborate a little more. How did he, how could he kind of fold himself into the city ballet story? Robbins, you mean? How Robbins, you yes, yes. He was Mr. Broadway. How did he manage to say, no, but I'm number two, man. I'm number two. I'm, I'm number two to Mr. Ballinger. How I know. did that happen? How well, did he do it? Because, I mean, not easily. <laughs> <laughs> I guess is one answer. I mean, uh -huh. they, I mean, how to explain this in a short, in a short moment, but I mean, Jerome Robbins was a great choreographer in his own right, and he was extremely different from Ballinger. I mean, even his earlier work, he, he called it uh, ballet and dumbbell. Mm -hmm. He was going to be the American vernacular. He was going to take ballet out of the court and into the streets and, you know, West Side Story yep. and all of this. And and Valentin invites him in 1949, the, 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 a year after the company is founded, you, you know, will you come? It, and, and or he calls, I can't remember which one yeah. it was, but immediately there's acceptance because I think Valentin recognized right away, this guy is really good. And he's good for us. He's good for our company. He's good for my project of establishing a company in New York. It's not, he's gonna help. He's going to be a good voice. So yeah, as you say, they were polar opposites in some ways. Valentin was in the studio civil, calm, uh, in control, dances came out reasonably easily, no matter how much he had worked, you know, sometimes years before on the score. So it's not that there was no work and they just poured out. It's that the work had been done elsewhere and then the work with the dancers was quite amenable and, and he was very easy with them. Robin's agony, you know, the, the black days, as they would call them, the, the, the abuse, the, the feelings of degradation, and, and yet, and yet, he too pulled things out of them. They all went back, not all, but most went back. They would work with him again. They would do it again. They would submit to this kind of torturous routine. I mean, Robin was famous for it getting to the opening night and he'd have four different versions of the same dance in, in rehearsal, you know, version A, version B, version C, version C1. And then he'd come on stage and he'd say, version B, version B. And they don't go, oh my God, no, version A, version B. They'd be like, you know, what's it going to be? What's it going to be? What's it? But, you know, here's another way, now to think of it, you know, of keeping the dancers alive on stage. You know, they're to not, terrify them. They're, they're terrifying. <laughs> and, and he was a bit of a taskmaster. You know, they do one pirouette, they do two pirouettes instead of one, and he'd be on top of them afterwards. What are you doing? So, you know, there, there was a way in which they were just like completely, you know, Russian Orthodox Jewish, Russian, Russian emigre, New York family. Um, it, it, it wasn't a likely fit, right. but it worked. And yes, there were problems and jealousies and, you know, Jerry in the early years, and why, why are you always, you know, he always gets top billing. I never get the billing. I want this, I want that. And then Jerry would make dances that would, you know, make headlines at the cage in 1952 or three, I can't remember. And, um, uh, Dance City Gathering, most famously, when the critics sort of said, maybe Balanchine's time is over. Maybe Robbins is the, is the new voice of our century, you know. Uh, didn't turn out to be true. Balanchine was still very much alive and kicking, and I wasn't going to let that happen. But so there was competition, too, between them. So I think there was, but if you read the Jerry, I mean, God bless him, Jerry has a huge archive and wrote a lot and was a great writer. So, you know, we have his diaries, we have his letters, we have, and that's another thing, you know, they competed over Tanakil Leclerc. Tanakil was in love with Bunker. 
and they were both in love with her. So even though Jerry was mostly gay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there was a whole complicated relationship between them. But when you come to Stravinsky Festival in 1972, and Balanchine has got them all there working every day, all day, and you listen to Jerry talk to the press and read his diaries, he is just in awe. How is this man, what this man has given us, how this man has, has brought us. And then one of the interviewers says, well, you know, brings up the funding and the money and the this, and he's like, I don't want to talk about money. Nobody here cares about money. And it's true, Valentine didn't care about money. It's not about money, it's about art. We are here to make art. He was absolutely in awe. So there's a way in which he too was part of the, this inner world that, that Valentine created that he started with. Yeah, so it is an amazing story. It's a little like Matisse saying, oh yeah, Pablo, I'll, I'll be second banana to you. Like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but he does. That's, 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 that's you don't right. seem to relate to their attitudes. Hmm? You don't seem to find that now. I think it's right. I, think it's right. I, I, I do it. None of us do. None of us find that natural. I think it's wonderful. I'm just amazed by it. Yeah. Yeah, and Balanchine was no, it was no prince. I mean, well, you know, he would sometimes would say, oh, Jerry Ferry, you know, Jerry Ferry. Yes, right. Homosexual. That's right. Even, even, even homophobic. Yeah, that's he was right. homophobic about it. And he, it was his way of expressing his jealousy, his intense jealousy. That Jerry would get these audiences that would be like, you know, it'd be like a rock concert. Jerry would be there and they'd be there. And he'd have the whole, that whole world in his hands and that came balance. So. But what he said earlier, a genius with humility, that is a rare gift. That is a rare gift. Yeah. Or who doesn't fall prey to the need for self promotion and money and all that he and all business. Really, really, you, really. You need and to... that was part of their devotion to him. He didn't care yeah. about money. His agents were all really upset. <laughs> How do you expect us they to make money for you when you tell them that you'll do it for free? Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't paid until 1962 yeah, or 1964 yeah. when the Ford Foundation insisted that he be paid on the, you know, the terms of the grant. So it's it, that that's a true truly what I try to teach is to students that can't understand that part. He didn't want to be famous and he didn't want to be in fact fame was a little bit of a problem because and the institutionalization when the company moved to Lincoln Center and they built the New York State Theater and all of a sudden and they got the Ford Foundation money and all of a sudden they are the establishment. And Balanchine was sort of like, maybe I should go to Europe and start another company. Because it's possibly, you know, he was very suspicious of bourgeois culture, <coughs> very suspicious of what money could do to you. It's going to cut your mm -hmm. creative edge. It's going to, you're going to become comfortable. Mm -hmm. You might, that was everything he was against. You know, the dancers, he was going to let them be comfortable. <coughs> I feel like this, I mean, this question was kind of like continue from that point. Yeah. I enjoyed the book so much and I feel like it's going to continue enriching my experiences of seeing his ballets and also just participating in dance as a dancer, and dance maker, and, uh, audience member. I was really drawn to the descriptions of his class and the relationship and the tension that happens sort of within the company about Balanchine's own ballet class and who wouldn't go and who would, and kind of what he would do. And it seems like, like there was a tension between kind of what he is telling people to do and versus dancers feeling like they know for themselves what they need to do his work well. And I sort of wondered about that. The question is sort of, is that tension a part of what makes something so spectacular? Is it spectacular in spite of that, of, of dancers having to go around or, or sort of navigate that? Um, where, yeah, that's my question. So, I mean, I think the class, you, it, it depends on when you're talking about, because the class, I mean, the class is so important because it's where he's gonna in, reinvent this technique. He's gonna do it on stage, but he's gonna do it especially in class because that's where he's got the dancers close up for hours. And they can meet even on a, you know, on a day off, which they often did, and spend two or three hours in the studio. Sometimes there was no pianist in Balanchine. Ford wouldn't just count. 
or nothing. Three, four, two, you know, just like stop time in the dance. And so those early years when he was really using class as a creative tool, um, there was a, lo a kind of loyal core of people that participated and went. Others weren't willing to give up their day off or weren't, just weren't as, as interested or devoted or for whatever reason, there was a sort of core group that was doing this. And a lot of it was happening around Tanning in the beginning. Um, and then later, when things are a little more established and we're in the 60s, 70s, you get this tension that you're talking about where his class, he's still teaching because he believes in teaching. And you know, there are these moments, just one I can't remember. He, he wants people in class. He wants the company to come to class because he's going to train them. But his classes are brutal. And they're often, you know, like, uh, I don't know how to explain this in non-technical terms, but, you know, he could give 64 tondus front side back faster, 64 again, faster. And then, you know, Ranajan, Rambama, everything, you know, more, more, more. And the dancers would be, this is like, you, you'd be on the floor, you know, it's really hard stuff. Really, oh, it's impossible, actually. A lot of what you would do would be impossible. And then they'd have a full day of rehearsal and be on stage. So there were dancers who would say, can't do it, just can't. And so I'm going to go to, you know, Stanley Williams, who knows what balance she kind of wants, but much gentler. It's going to be gentler. I'm going to get taken care of. I'm going to get warmed up. I'm going to be correctly placed. My body is not going to hurt. I'm going to be able to face the day and the performance. But Balanchine didn't like that. So did, did the performances then become spectacular sort of in the course of all these tensions? I mean, that's hard to answer, right? I mean, maybe for someone like Ellie Villella, the answer is yes, because you could see him, you know, there's films of him in the wings and he's a real, wow, he's a drama king. <laughs> he, he, is, he is suffering too. He's deeply suffering in his body, but he's giving 500% on stage. And you talk about being more alive than alive. He was, and then he would just, you know, it's like almost like a cliche, right? He would then collapse in the wings like a boxer or something. Um, so these, but these tensions were were sort of part of the fabric of the company. And the dancers would start class in the morning and with Balanchine, and he'd say, "It's a company of eighty something, and there's forty people here. The others must be at church. <laughs> 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 Their church. <laughs> Their church. Exactly. We have one more comment right behind. Yeah. I first I want to congratulate you. The book was absolutely brilliant. The observation about some of the movements and add-on coming out of Balanchine's work with Panikia Claire, it's not the first time I've read this. It's, um, I've read it elsewhere before. And I there's a part of me that's still puzzled by it because you can see some of the same dynamics between a ballerina and her partner in earlier Balanchine works, such as Four Temperaments, in particular, the opening three themes. So I, you know, to put, I mean, I, I know you tempered what you said today by saying, well, some of them thought this, that it may have come out of this, but other people just write as if it's a given and they ignore the earlier works, you can see it in Hyde Divertimento, you know, and other, others, I'm not going to name all of them, but I just want to know what your response to my observation is. Yeah, I think you're, you're right, I and mean, it's tricky territory, for sure, um, and that's why I'm careful to say, you know, it, it, to me it's important that the dancers think that, because that's part of what they're going into it with. I mean, it was Melissa Hayden at first, and she's in the dance in a different section, um, in the original, and so there's a, and, and Arthur Mitchell himself said this to me, so there are other, there, there's a way in which the fact that the dancers thought it 
makes it in some key true. No. <laughs> what you say is also true, of course, right? That there are, are other sources and there were other sources and, and then there are sources we don't know about for almost everything, including musical sources. So it's hard to, to parse it, but I, I, I take your point and I think it's, that's why I always put it in terms of what the dancers have told me. We have a question on Zoom, so I'm Yeah, we're you. just a little over time, but I think we have, have time for another question. Uh, so Patricia uh, writes that, um, notes that many of Valentin's dancers, both male and female, were fatherless, and, and Valentin himself uh, sort of took Stravinsky for a father. Uh, Patricia asks, might you say a few words about this aspect of the dynamic in the family that Balanchine created around him? So the idea of the family, the company, him as a center, central figure. Yeah, I mean, that was a theme for me because I, I was um, a bit surprised, to be honest, when I first started interviewing the, the dancers of the early company, the ones that are still alive. And I started to notice that every time, you know, I almost started to expect it that there would be a missing father or there would be a broken family or there would be a, a sort of sense of, of some kind of, well, mainly a missing father and also a lot more Jewish families than I had anticipated. So there, and there was a kind of feeling that a lot of these families were not feeling a fact that a lot of these families, the, the dancers were the children of people who had also lived through some of the calamities of the early 20th century and had ended up in New York from East Central Europe. And so there was a way in which they were drawn to this art form because of their own connections to Russian culture and to um, just a ballet, which had a, had a larger life there than it did in America at the time. So, so yeah, and then the father figure idea and the family, the company is a family. They often talked about it that way. Certainly, it wasn't always a happy family, um, but but I do think, and part of it is that they toured together, especially in those early years. They were on the road a lot of the time in Europe, so they were living out of hotels, out of suitcases, in theaters, eating together, drinking, sleeping, whatever. They were all there together, and so there was a sort of family aspect of feeling to it. And I think it also is part of the sense of devotion that many of the women came to have for him. You know, those dynamics change a little bit as the company gets bigger and more successful. Maybe you can ask me, after reading this book, I would just be curious since I've been going to ballet for longer than reading this book. And does something change, do you think, from now on when you see any ballet or Balanchine after reading the book. Um, for me, something changed. I'll give you the answer because it's maybe easier to. I look at ballet no more as a relational practice and not as much as on that stage, these people. But there's so much in an entire world of relations, of communication, of being with somebody and relating or broken relationships. So, in some ways, I see it much more as not that couple or this one person or this whole about me. Well, the stage makes you feel it's sort of this thing curtain opens, that's happened, then it's gone. And now, now I feel like, wow, they're actually living this life. And this is a moment in their life that I'm sort of have this amazing, I can see something, but I see a life and I don't see just this moment on stage. So this feels much more like ballet is a life form and you get to see something. And as if when the curtain closed, they keep on doing it. You just happen to have that privileged moment to get the curtain to show. That's what this book does, I feel. To see it's very relational, it's deeply relational, unlike other arts. Not all arts are like that. So, because you're not working with other bodies. Well, he you always know, not did. In all cases. would often like to say, he taught us how to. I mean, I think my reaction is similar. I think it really humanized to sort of mm -hmm. ballet and also Balanchine for me. I mean, I came to appreciate Balanchine first, through a good friend of mine, Scott Rothkopf, who came to appreciate Balanchine through Anne Bass, who was a great patron of the arts and a huge supporter of New York City Ballet. And they both, you know, so I would go and, and watch with them. And I think, you know, for Scott, it was this, this kind of sheer perfection that you see on stage. And there is something that's just so unforgettably just kind of 
perfect about a Balanchine production, but I think also what you really bring out are the kind of the imperfections and that it turns, you know, it revolves around those, those two poles and the kind of, I don't know, it, there's a layer of, of humanity, you know, mm -hmm. kind of intimacy, but also human, that, that cool icy surface, I think is a little bit cracked mm -hmm. and that makes it more interesting for me to watch, mm -hmm. you know, and to, to now to see it and it's forever changed after reading your book and, and enriched in that, in that way. And I think that ultimately, you know, there, there, is a, there is a kind of veneer in some way of this kind of, their references to what the earlier traditions of ballet really aspire to. The fact that it doesn't quite get there, it holds this liminal state, it's that state of metamorphosis, you know, that is how the, I don't know, that's, that for me makes it even more kind of seductive and appealing. And, and also makes me want to go, you know, I also understand the real value of, it's never the same, I mean, ballet is always different, we all know that, but it, it makes me want to go again and again and again to see the same production. And I think that's something that you know, mentally. Really Jenny, how are you now? <laughs> After yeah. having written this book, it's not that you're going to run to the next book, but uh, you also, being in such a strict discipline for a long time, there's a weird moment when the curtain came up. Here's the book. Now you're on book tour. But you, does your body miss that routine? Um, well, I don't know. I will, I will tell you that I, um, I finished the book, I turned it in, and I had a physical crisis. My body basically fell apart. And I don't know exactly, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine, but I wasn't fine. I was just kind of, I kind of, it was a kind of, collapse and nervous exhaustion, something was not right. I was, and I don't know whether it was the, the loss of the discipline or the cost of the discipline, or maybe both, but it took me, you know, over a year to sort of recover myself out of, out of that, that moment. And it wasn't that I true. couldn't work or anything like that. I was really full functional and all of that, but I was not, well in my body. So there was something, and I think it partly has to do with my physical therapist saying, if you're going to sit for 10 years, what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> but you're better now. I'm better now. And you I'm found better. a way to... I have found a way to, to manage this, yes. It's but actually, it is, it's, but it is... And your body is showing the symptoms of writing a book, which is writing, what you're writing about. Writing this, takes... This. You know, I always thought dancing was the problem as far as physical... <laughs> <laughs> goes, you know. But actually dancing, I think, is the, was the least of but that's a, is, yeah. Yeah. a very beautiful way to end maybe yeah. using ballet is also it's an art of ideas <laughs> and then you say writing is actually a practice of the body that's, that's right that's right it's, it's it sure. is that's actually very so stand up yeah. a lot but we're, <laughs> yes, but we're so happy that you've joined us tonight and meredith for joining us and actually having this conversation with jenny so I just want to remind our future viewers, this is Valentine's Day 2023. <laughs> and as we try to talk about it, this happened once. So for me, it's the great pleasure and joy of my job that I get to read such a book, immerse myself to the extent I can in something which is transformative. So it has changed my way of seeing things. And it's really wonderful to have Meredith Martin and Jennifer Homans here at the Center for the Humanities to talk about Mr. B. George Balanchine's 20th century and everybody happy Valentine's. Go out and